Hi, my name is Evan Engelstad, and I'll be presenting about nutrition for pianists today. Um, and this information will apply, of, of course, to other musicians and other human beings too, but uh, today we'll focus mostly on pianists, since this is the Piano Celebration Week presented annually at uh, Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. And before I begin, I want to give a huge thank you to the festival directors, Drs. Dino and Sang Mi. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to participate in this, uh, this great event. Um, so, a uh, little background about myself. I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, uh, where I teach piano lessons, I accompany choir, do other uh, various uh, teaching as, as required. Um, I'm also trained in nutrition. Uh, I am a nutritional therapy practitioner, as certified by the Nutritional Therapy Association. And so I take clients and help them with um, various health issues that they're, they're struggling with, and I help them with their nutrition and lifestyle changes. You can check out more of my work at evaningelstad.com. And I'll be putting up a special link for this presentation with resources uh, that I mention at evaningelstad.com slash piano. Uh, so, my nutritional training revolved around the central concept of eating a nutrient-dense, properly prepared whole foods diet. Uh, and within that, we learned five foundations to nutritional health. And I'll be uh, talking about these five foundations throughout the presentation today. So I just wanted to tell you about them from the beginning. The first foundation, the most important one, is digestion. Uh, you know, we can be eating the most perfect diet with all the perfect nutrients, but if we're not absorbing them, then it does us no good, right? Um, so that's the most important foundation. The second one is blood sugar balance, which is important for our energy levels. It's important for our hormonal health, which uh, uh, really um, is important for the way we see the world. Uh, it's important for our weight uh, levels. Third foundation is fatty acids or dietary fats. You know, we've been um, trained to be quite scared of fats in our, our culture, uh, but the fact is all of our cells have a lipid membrane that's made up of fats. Our brains are made up of a lot of fats and cholesterols. So eating healthy fats is actually really important uh, for a good diet and uh, also avoiding the unhealthy and the toxic fats. So we'll talk about that more in depth uh, as we go along. The fourth foundation is minerals, mineral balance. Minerals are not only important for our structure, uh, you know, the bones, our teeth, that kind of thing, but they're also important for the electrical health of our body with nerve conduction and osmotic balance um, in between the cells and their environment. So uh, that relates to our energy levels, it relates to our sense of well-being, um, so we'll be talking about minerals. Final foundation, very important, is hydration. Uh, we're between 60 and 70 percent water by weight, we, we as human beings. Uh, and actually, if you count up the molecules uh, of, of your body, 98.9 percent of the molecules in your body are water molecules. So it's, it, water is extremely important. Uh, it can really affect your energy levels, your anxiety levels, your joint health, all the things we're going to be talking about today. So we'll, we'll uh, get into water. Um, throughout the presentation. So that, those are the five foundations that I'll be referring to and going into more depth about. Uh, so the presentation is kind of going to go like this. Uh, first I'll talk about my general philosophy, my thoughts and personal opinions about diet and try to address this question, what should we eat? Uh, then I'm going to give you a brief kind of Cliff Notes version of digestion since it's so important for our health. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what good digestion is and give you some, some action steps on how to achieve that. Uh, then I'll address some common issues that we pianists uh, unfortunately face quite often and those are joint and muscle pain, um, low energy levels or low focus ability, um, your immune health, you know, getting sick often, and then finally uh, performance anxiety 
issues, and, and I'll kind of relate all those to um, those foundations of, of diet. And um, then finally, I'll finish out the presentation by uh, giving a, a couple of cooking demonstrations. I'm going to show you how to make two what I consider to be essential foods for all pianists to be eating uh, regularly. Those are sauerkraut and bone broth. So, uh, I'll get into the question of what do we eat uh, right next. So I wanted to start out with the question, what should we eat? Uh, this is a difficult question. Um, you know, I think if you ask most people what the perfect diet for them is, uh, it would be difficult to answer. Um, and of course there's concerns of being able to afford the healthy food or having enough time to prepare healthy meals. But even if you had unlimited money and unlimited time to cook, um, I feel like it would still be difficult to answer, well, what's the perfect diet to eat? Um, so I wanted to start out with this question um, and kind of how do we know that? How do we begin to start to answer this question? Um, so maybe you can read a book about it. You know, that's, this is kind of where I started. You know, I'll go find a book. So, of course, you go to the bookstore, and you go to the diet section, and you find the one book in the diet section uh, that says, Perfect Diet for You. You buy it for $15, question answered, problem solved. Uh, obviously not really. Uh, you walk into the diet section, hundreds if not thousands of titles, and each one of them is saying, this is the perfect diet for you. Um, so, kind of overwhelming, right? Um, a similar story with, uh, with looking at scientific studies. So I, then I thought, well, I'll look at some science, you know, scientific studies. That'll tell me what the best, you know, diet is. And uh, again, good luck sifting through hundreds of thousands, if not millions of studies on nutrition and diet. Uh, every single ingredient you can think of every nutrient, every molecule has been studied in myriad ways, uh, and uh, and then of course they come to conflicting conclusions. Oftentimes, uh, I searched eggs, for instance, uh, the other day on PubMed, and it came up with seventy thousand hits on, uh, that mentioned eggs in the studies. Uh, so then you read a couple studies. One, you know concludes, yes, eggs are part of a healthy diet, and, you know, the next one concludes eggs are, you know, not healthy and should be avoided, um, and so you have to sift through, well, okay, let me look at the funding of these studies, because that maybe, you know, that'll you know, tell me about the bias that was inherent in the study, and the one that said eggs are healthy was funded, of course, by the National Egg Council, the one that said eggs are unhealthy was funded by the uh, National eat cereal for breakfast foundation or what you know whatever so of course looking into the funding or the, the methodology um, is all important for studying science it takes a lot of time a lot of effort um, it can be very overwhelming as well uh, okay so sheesh what what can i do let's look okay, i'll go to the grocery store they sell food there's got to be something in there that is healthy for me <laughs> right so, uh, so you walk into your grocery store and you're, you're confronted with 40 to 50,000 unique items for sale. And most of these items are, you know, have been packaged and processed by corporations whose main goal is for you to get, for you to buy these items. Not for you to be healthy or to create healthy items, but for you to buy them. You know, they've been designed to, to be addictive, tasty, super appealing. Uh, cheap. They've been designed to be to, to last on the shelves for a long time. Uh, being healthy was not the primary concern for most of these items, I would say. Um, so, okay, so we need a better answer to this question, what should we eat, or where should we even start to look for information about what to eat? So, think about this. Um, in, the, in the past, there was no question of what to eat. There was no asking which book do I read, which science do I look at, which foods do I choose from the grocery store. 
there's no question. You know, for our very distant ancestors, and I'm, I'm talking about 10,000 or more years ago, who lived as, as hunter-gatherers, the only option was to eat what I call real food. Um, they ate directly from their environment. They had uh, expert, what I would say, multiple PhD level knowledge of things like hunting and trapping and foraging and plant identification and use, uh, migration patterns, seasonal changes, all these types of things. Uh, and they knew how to just get food from their environment. Um, and this allowed them to not only survive, but to actually thrive. Uh, all the documentation I've seen from archaeologists, anthropologists, researchers like Weston A. Price, who I will mention, or I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, all this information shows that these people that were getting their, their food from their, their immediate environment did not suffer from the widespread chronic diseases that we unfortunately suffer from in our culture. Uh, they were all able to move their bodies in a variety of ways, including be, being able to walk a minimum of five miles every single day. Uh, they lived happy lives, did not suffer from chronic anxiety or depression. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, they uh, were able to produce healthy, well-formed children, generation after generation. Uh, so I should, I should address a common myth um, that our hunter-gatherer ancestors did not live happy or long lives. For a very thorough rebuttal uh, and a great read in general to this common myth, uh, that we live better lives than our hunter-gatherer ancestors, you can refer to the book uh, Civilized to Death by Christopher Ryan. Of course, life was not perfect, life was never perfect, and there were, um, there were times of famine and, you know, problems and uh, suffering. There's always suffering, uh, but uh, there was also no evidence of these chronic health problems that we suffer today. Um, there was no e evidence of the widespread anxiety and depression. Um, and apparently, they, you know, the estimates were that they, they worked, and I use that to mean they hunted and gathered food, for only about four hours per day. So they were not overworking themselves either. So my, my uh, philosophy here is that we can look to these populations that do not suffer from these problems like obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, anxiety, depression, arthritis. All, in, in these populations, these, these things were either non-existent or very rare. Uh, so we can look at these populations to see what we can learn about their lifestyle and about, uh, you know, especially their diet. Uh, now, I should also note that we're not just talking about distant ancestors that lived, you know, over 10,000 years ago. There are still uh, populations that live as hunter-gatherers today, um, albeit they're very rare. Um, and they're getting rarer and rarer as Western civilization spreads. But um, So we can look to these populations. And one researcher who did just this, uh, his name is Weston A. Price, and he uh, was researching back in the 1930s when there were a few more of these hunter-gatherer societies still in existence. Um, and he wrote a book about his findings in 1939 called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Uh, Weston A. Price has been referred to as the Isaac Newton of nutrition. You know, he's, he's a groundbreaking book. Um, and what he did, he was a dentist, and um, so he was curious about uh, why all of his patients were getting more and more tooth decay. Every year he noticed more and more tooth decay happening, especially in the children. And so he was curious uh, as to what was happening with that. Why, you know, why is tooth decay getting worse? Um, and instead of trying to find what caused the tooth decay, he decided, well, I'm going to look to populations that don't have tooth decay and to see what they're doing that may be preventing it. So he traveled the world to all these remote locations, uh, the mountainous region, regions of Switzerland, to these isolated tribes there. Uh, he visited the the uh, indigenous Australians. He visited the Polynesians. Um, he visited uh, African tribes in Sub-Saharan Africa. All these places where uh, they were eating their traditional diet, 
and they were not eating what he called the displacing foods of modern commerce, uh, which were at the time and, and still today uh, white flour, uh, white sugar, canned foods, and refined vegetable oils mainly. So they were not eating these things, and they were eating directly from their environment. And um, and he compared these these isolated tribes um, with limited or no contact with the West to um, their diets to the, to the typical Western diet. Uh, and he found that these these isolated tribes that were eating their indigenous foods had almost no tooth decay. They had basically perfectly formed jaws and. and and tooth structures, dental structures, um, and they also had very high immunity to tuberculosis, uh, as, as well as being able to produce healthy and well-formed children. So they were, by all accounts, very healthy people. Now, unfortunately, he occasionally observed, observed these tribes, you know, a new road would be built, and they would, would have access to the foods um, that of modern commerce, you know, the flowers, the refined vegetable oils, the canned foods, and uh, they would adopt that diet, and he would observe this, and what he found was that when they, when they changed their diet, they had more cavities, they, um, ha their children had more crooked teeth, um, they had lower immunity to tuberculosis, and so this kind of showed to him that it wasn't genetics that was was creating this vibrant health. It was the foods they were eating. And when you took away those foods, their health kind of went away as well. So, uh, so what do they eat? You know, that's the question. Like, what can we learn from these, these indigenous tribes? Um, and of course, they had widely varying diets. You know, the people that were living up in the Arctic, for example, had a completely different diet than the, the people living near the equator just based on their environment, what foods they had around them. Um, but he found some commonalities in their diets, and those were the following. They ate no industrially refined or processed foods like the flour or the vegetable oils or the sugar or the canned foods. Uh, he found that they, they all ate omnivorous diets, meaning they included both plant and animal foods. Um, and of the animal foods that they ate, they ate a portion of it raw, interestingly enough. Uh, their diets were four times higher in calcium and other minerals, and ten times higher in the fat-soluble nutrients, uh, vitamins A, D, E, and K, than the typical Western diet at the time. They ate foods with high enzyme contents, meaning raw fruits and vegetables, uh, fermented foods, things like that. Um, he found that when they ate uh, foods that were, were seeds or grains or legumes or nuts, that they did um, some common processing techniques to make them more digestible, like soaking them or sprouting them or fermenting them or naturally leavening them, to make them you know, not only more digestible but also to take away some of the anti-nutrients that are found in those types of foods. Um, he found that they ate, no matter where they lived, they ate approximately a, an equal ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids. I'll explain this a little bit more uh, coming up in the presentation, but uh, your omega-3 fatty acids are kind of like uh, mostly found in fish oils and in plant foods like uh, walnuts and chia seeds and flax seeds and things like that. Also in uh, certain leafy greens too have them. So those are your omega-3s. They were about equal proportion to the omega-6, which today we get a lot of omega-6 found in vegetable oils, um, but back then it was approximately equal. Uh, and they all ate some unrefined salt, either from the sea or from inland salt deposits. And finally, they all ate bones. <laughs> uh, not necessarily just gnawing on the bones, but they, they made bone broths. Uh, it was the most common way they consumed bone, animal bones. Um, very high in minerals and other nutrients. I'll be showing you how to make bone broth later in the presentation as well. Okay, so uh, that's great. Hunter-gatherers, they were eating a great diet, but we're, we, we, 
are not hunter-gatherers, obviously. It's not a realistic lifestyle for most of us uh, to go out and, and do this and get all of our food from the environment. Um, however, we can still do a little bit of hunter, hunting and gathering, you know, um, uh, and get, you know, so my point here is that the best source of food possible, even if it's not realistic, the best source of food is wild food from our environment that we hunt and gather. Um, and while this may seem quite unrealistic, there, there are ways to kind of dabble in it that I've tried. Uh, one is foraging for wild foods. Uh, and I'll, I'll include the books uh, by Samuel Thayer, the foraging books that are wonderful resources, make it very simple to go find some wild uh, plants to forage and include in your diet. And it can be as easy as going out to your lawn and gathering a salad of dandelion greens, clover, plantains, heal all, uh, purslane. Um, there was one other one that I am forgetting. But all these, all these plants are found in most lawns and make it a great addition to any salad. They are strongly flavored, highly nutritious foods, uh, sometimes medicinal even. But, um, yeah, so uh, that can be as easy as that to include some wild foods in your diet. Um, just make sure your lawn is not then spray sprayed with, uh, you know, toxic weed killers because you don't want to be eating that. Now, I personally haven't gotten into hunting, but, you know, people hunt, obviously, uh, and fish and trap. Uh, so that's another way, if you're into that, to get some wild uh, food into your diet. So now, aside from, from that, what's the best approximation to getting wild food? Uh, well, there are some, still some foods in the store that you could find that, are, that have not been cultivated uh, too much. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the, the fruits and vegetables in our, in our stores have been cultivated for certain traits, like uh, to be sweeter, to be larger, uh, to last longer on the shelf, um, uh, to not have seeds. And unfortunately, these traits tend to make the plant less nutritious as well. Um, but there are some plants in the, in the grocery store that you can find uh, that are close to their wild ancestors. And uh, the author Arthur Haynes, who's also a, a botanist, um, he uh, provides a list of some of these foods in his book, A New Path. Wonderful book, highly recommend it. Um, and so all of these, these cultivated plants, they resemble their wild ancestors. They ha all have robust flavor. Um, they all still contain their seeds. And they all can, you know, if you're growing them in the garden, they can all have the potential to escape and grow wild. Uh, so just to, I'll, I'll include this full list uh, in the resources to this presentation, but a couple examples that you can find in stores are beets or beetroot, uh, garlic, ginger, uh, onion, uh, avocado, a lot of the berries, like blackberries and blueberries, asparagus, uh, most of the spices and herbs, uh, Brazil nuts, spinach, uh, hazelnuts, quinoa, and uh, sunflower seeds. These are all close to wild foods and are, are great nutritious, nutrient-dense foods. Um, now, obviously, eating real food, eating wild food, is a continuum. On one side, you know, obviously, ideally, we would eat like the hunter-gatherers, uh, completely wild from our environment. On the other side of the spectrum, you have your completely processed, industrial-made factory food, Franken-foods, that, you know, can are very nutrient-poor, uh, but could last through the, the nuclear holocaust, you know. I'm, not going to mention any names, Twinkies, <clears throat> but uh, you know what I mean by the highly processed Franken foods. Um, that's at you know the the one end, and then completely wild is at the other. Obviously, we want to be as close as we can to that uh, wild side uh, to be eating the best diet. Uh, so, aside from the approximations I just listed, uh, uh, the best ones that, that fit within most of our lifestyles where we you know shop at grocery stores and the occasional farmers market. Um, I've listed in, in a resource that I've included called Macronutrient Guidelines, 
which gives you examples of healthy sources of fats and proteins and carbohydrates that you can choose from the store. These are all essentially whole, unprocessed, uh, properly prepared, which I'll go into later, um, nutrient-dense foods. And ideally, they are, they're also like seasonal, um, local, and grown without chemicals. Uh, things, these are things you would normally find in the perimeter of the grocery store, rather than the middle. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is, obviously your optimal diet is going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on your age, your activity level, your sex, your genetics, and your heritage, your environment that you live in, your taste preferences, uh, what temperature you keep your house at, you know, all these things can, de can de uh, determine what the perfect diet for you is. Um, and the reason that all those diet books are successful and can be published is that they did work for at least a percentage of the people, right? So, um, so while we can try to learn as much as we can from these populations that did not suffer the types of health problems that we want to avoid, there's also a certain amount of experimentation that needs to needs to happen uh, to find out what the perfect diet for you personally is. You know, you know yourself the best. You know when some subtle change is happening that makes you feel a little bit better. Um, and so, I encourage you to uh, try, you know, some dietary changes. You know, uh, and as you do that, uh, I'll give you a couple pieces of advice here. So if you are inspired to change your diet in any way due to this presentation uh, and to look into it, do some more research on your own, I would encourage you to uh, keep these th things in mind. First, use a food journal. This is um, a really important tool to help you track your changes. Basically you just write down what you eat at your meal, what time you ate it, and then you write down your, your how you're feeling your mood, your digestion, your energy levels, anything you can think of that it, that might be related to the food choices. This helps you kind of pinpoint what you're eating and how it's making you feel. You can you can start to realize things like, oh, I ate that big uh, bowl of cereal, and then an hour later I was like taking a nap, completely sluggish. Or I ate this salad meal with, you know, hard-boiled egg, and I felt, you know, pretty stable after that. Uh, these types of things you can notice much clearer if you write it down and you kind of track it specifically. Um, and then I encourage you to be to be patient with changes that you might undertake. You know, give it at least a week or two before you decide if it's working or not, because uh, some things can take take a little while to to uh, make changes in how you feel. Uh, and then finally, be honest and wholehearted with yourself. You know, give it a chance for it uh, a dietary change to work. Um, be sure you're like defining your, your goals very specifically um, so that you know if you're succeeding or or not. So the, the one thing that was missing from this uh, discussion here is a discussion of water. Um, and I don't want you to not worry, I will address water later in the, in the presentation, but there's some issues uh, similar to choosing the right food um, that I'll, I'll get into. So that was kind of my philosophy of diet and uh, what we should eat, where we should look for the answers of the question, what should we eat. Um, and before we continue, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer. I'm not diagnosing or treating any diseases. Um, none of you are my clients or, or my patients. Uh, I am uh, hopefully providing inspiration for you to look more into the, the subject of nutrition uh, yourself. Uh, and to give you some basic nutrition education. Uh, if you do have serious health issues, make sure you, you are in touch with your official health care ally because dietary changes can um, affect the dosages that you need of certain pharmaceutical drugs that you might be taking. So, uh, But for, I would say for the most part, um, doing minor changes to your diet, like drinking a little more water or tweaking your macronutrient ratios slightly is not uh, dangerous for the most part. And uh, if you do start to feel worse, you can just discontinue the changes and you should be back to normal very soon. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's my spiel. 
Let's get into um, digestion next. So let's talk about digestion. Uh, digestion is very important for a pianist's health uh, because a lot of issues that we we suffer from commonly, like joint health, immune system health, energy levels, performance anxiety, uh, oftentimes can uh, trace back to poor digestion. So digestion is a really good foundation of health. If we're not absorbing these nutrients, then they're not able to help us uh, with these issues. And I'm going to describe digestion from the top to the bottom, uh, kind of like a river. If things are going wrong in the top of digestion towards the north, you know, it can affect things further south. So uh, without further ado, let's get started with the brain. That's where digestion starts. Not the mouth, not with chewing, but with actually the brain. When you see uh, and smell and even hear the sizzle of uh, cooking wholesome, delicious food, it triggers your salivary glands, your mouth starts watering it. Your digestive system starts getting ready to take in nutrients. Uh, so that's where digestion begins. And if we're distracted, if we're watching stimulating TV, for example, that's going to interfere with our optimal digestion. Okay, so then we take our first bite. Uh, chewing enough uh, is very important because it mixes your food with the salivary enzymes and it prevents large chunks of food from making it further south in the system where it can cause problems. Um, the stomach expects a bolus of food. It doesn't expect chunks, it expects more of you know, a, a, a slurry, essentially. Um, so when that slurry gets to our stomach, uh, we need to have a very acidic stomach, actually. Um, Stomach acid, uh, well, for all, the, all you chemists out there, it needs to be between 1.5 and 3 uh, pH level. This is for, for two reasons. One, it needs to be that acidic to break down uh, nutrients, uh, namely protein and certain minerals. Um, but it also acts as a barrier to things we don't want to get further down into our system, like bacteria, viruses, uh, Parasites, these types of things. It, it, it digests those proteins as well so that they don't get further down and cause imbalances in our system. Um, stress can lower your stomach acid. Dehydration, lack of certain nutrients like vitamin C and zinc and B vitamins. Um, excessive carbohydrates, especially refined sugars. Uh, uh, Al excessive alcohol consumption and also food allergies or sensitivities can all they can all contribute to lower stomach acid and interestingly enough you may not realize this but low too low of stomach acid is actually a potential cause of heartburn um, and this is kind of how it works if you don't have enough stomach acid your food is not getting broken down properly this causes the food to remain in the stomach for longer than it should. And when it's sitting in your stomach for longer than it should, it, it uh, can ferment. The carbohydrates can ferment. The fats can rancidify. The proteins can putrefy. It gets nasty. And all this causes excess gas in your stomach, which can cause that what's supposed to be a one-way valve at the bottom of your esophagus in your stomach it can cause that to back up and release the contents of your stomach into the into the esophagus. And while the acid level is not high enough for proper digestion, it's still high enough to cause pain and discomfort in your esophagus. So that's one way that, that too low a stomach acid can actually contribute to heartburn. Um, so, going back to our process, the food uh, is churned and chemically digested further in the stomach and it should go into the small intestine now. Uh, and it should be acidic enough to trigger the enzymes from the pancreas. Uh, and it should also be triggering the gallbladder to release bile. Uh, this further digests the food, extracting more nutrients from it. Uh, talking about bile, uh, it's very important to, for digesting fats. 
and to digest fats we need to eat quality fats to produce good quality bile. Uh, eating poor quality fats, unhealthy fats like trans fats, hydrogenated oils, uh, or a low fat diet actually can contribute to poor bile production and therefore poor fat digestion. Uh, the pancreas is important in this stage of digestion. It, um, the pancreas does a lot of things. It's involved not only in digestion, but also in blood sugar regulation. So if we're eating a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet, that can stress the pancreas out and take it, its energies away from its other function of di helping you with digestion, providing enzymes. So um, another thing about the pancreas is that uh, well, every, every organ in your body relies on a certain nutrient that it needs in abundance to do its job properly. For the pancreas, that's chromium. So, uh, to help out the, the pancreas, you can eat a diet that's high in chromium. Uh, well, uh, you get enough of chromium. And chromium is found in shellfish, broccoli, grapes, meat, um, Brazil nuts, whole wheat, and wine. Uh, not too much wine, of course, just a glass or two is probably, probably fine. Um, now, if poorly digested food, so this could be either from not chewing enough or from too low a stomach acid, if that gets down into the small intestine, uh, it can cause problems like um, leaky gut syndrome and food allergies, which are not conducive to piano playing, I would say. Alright, now we get to the large intestine. This is... Um, where your microbiome, or the bacteria that you have in your body, the flora, is very important. These microbial um, symbionts, if you want to call them that, are essential for creating things that we need, like vitamin K, vitamin B1, vitamin B2, and B12. Uh, we rely on these, these bacteria to help us create these nutrients that we need. Now, if leftovers, if uh, if things make it down into the large intestine that aren't supposed to be there, undigested food, again, from not chewing enough or from low stomach acid, then we can cause excessive inflammation um, that can, can contribute to ir uh, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, colitis, celiac disease, uh, cause a lot of problems. It can also uh, disrupt your water recycling that happens in the, in the large intestine, contrib contributing to dehydration. Um, and it can also uh, interfere with that important bacterial balance that we talked about. And then finally, we get to the end of the line, elimination. And uh, the only thing I'll say about that is, if you're having trouble in that area, you may look into a, a toilet stool, the most um, popular brand I believe is called Squatty Potty and uh, that can help you get into a, a uh, squatting position which helps the alignment and helps your elimination. Okay so let's talk about some action steps uh, for good digestion. How do we make sure we're, we're getting all the nutrients from the food we're eating? First of all, like I said, digestion begins in the brain so we need to calm ourselves. If we're overly agitated it's not going to be good for our digestion. So turn off the TV, turn off the podcast, put the phone down, close the laptop, and take a few breaths. Feel your connection to the ground. This can also help calm you. Uh, eating on the floor. Uh, some cultures eat on the floor. Uh, and then take a moment to appreciate the food before you start eating it. And uh, of course it helps your appreciation of the food if you cook it with your, with your friends and family. Uh, and are smelling it, uh, and seeing it, and actively preparing it. That definitely helps the appreciation. Gets the juices flowing, gets the mouth watering, and the like. Uh, you might uh, say a prayer of thanks to yourself or to, you know, out loud. You know, thanking the people that prepare the food, the people that grew the food. Uh, thanking the plants and animals and fungi and whatever else you're eating. Uh, for giving its life so that you can take in the nutrients and continue your life. Visualizing those nutrients going into your body, uh, looking at the beautiful combinations of colors and textures of each ingredient, the synergy of 
of uh, the ingredients put together in this alchemical act of cooking. You know, and then close your eyes, appreciate the smell of the food. All these things are going to get you really ready to take in these nutrients. And then when you start eating, I just encourage you to eat slowly and chew plenty. You know, we want to make sure that that uh, not only are we mechanically breaking down the food, but that we're allowing the chemical digestion to happen with the saliva. The saliva um, has a lot of enzymes that will digest the carbohydrates specifically, but also proteins and fats to some extent. Um, so that's very important, so that it's not overwhelming the rest of your system down south uh, uh, by not chewing enough. Okay, and then how do we promote good stomach acid? Uh, well, first of all, we need to eat a good, uh, a nutrient-dense, high-quality diet uh, with enough zinc, vitamin C, and B vitamins in particular. And you can find zinc in things like oysters and um, uh, beef and liver. Um, you could find vitamin C in a lot of vegetables like actually cabbage, and especially sauerkraut, fermented cabbage is especially high in vitamin C, surprisingly. And of course, citrus fruits are, are a decent source of vitamin C. Uh, and then B vitamins, again, from sources of meat. Uh, you also don't want to eat too high a carbohydrate diet, um, especially your refined carbohydrates and your sugars. Um, and then again, avoid overconsumption of alcohol. That can reduce your stomach acid production. You want to drink enough real water. We'll talk about the specifics of that a little bit later. Uh, stress can interfere with your stomach acid production, so in any way that you can, if you have high stress, try to lower that as much as you can. Meditation, uh, exercise, yoga, taking baths, whatever you can find to get your stress levels so that they're not chronically high will help your digestion. Uh, and then there's um, aids that you can use before a meal to help your di your stomach acid. Those are digestive bitters, which are it's a, a, a mixture of certain herbs that are, are bitter that stimulate digestive juices going. Uh, you can dilute some apple cider vinegar or lemon juice in water. Uh, and there are hydrochloric acid supplements that, that you can take as well. Um, now, the next step, we want to promote good bile production and flow. Uh, you're going to want to eat healthy fats, like I said. And like for a good source, you know, for examples of healthy fats, you can see the, the resource I'll include with this presentation called Macronutrient Guidelines. Um, and uh, one thing that can really help with your bile production, uh, I've actually personally experienced benefit from this at times, is beets, beetroot, or uh, the juice of beets. This can really help your bile uh, flow. And, uh, and you can, if, if this appeals to you, you can research certain herbs that act as cholagogues. C-H-O-L-A-G-O-G-U-E-S. Cholagogues are herbs that um, act as a bile stimulant, basically. Um, some examples the many that are out there, uh, dandelion root, uh, sage, this is, by the way, sage, and this is why sage goes so well with sausage, because it helps you digest that fat. Turmeric, um, other bitter uh, roots, herbs. And then finally, we need to promote healthy bacterial balance in our large intestine, and a healthy microbiome in general. Um, so the ways to do this, avoid a high sugar diet. Sugar feeds certain species of bacteria that be can become imbalanced, so we don't want to really feed those too much. So avoid a high sugar diet. Uh, you can eat plenty of fermented uh, or probiotic foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, yogurt, kefir, uh, kombucha, fermented pickles, um, natto, just whatever it sounds good to you, whatever is in your culture and your tradition, as much uh, fermented foods as possible. That's a, a very, very good way to keep your, your bacterial balance uh, going. And then, you know, spend as much time outdoors in nature, 
interacting with other living beings, it's going to increase the diversity of your microbiome, uh, which is turning out to be very important for our health. You know, we have, uh, it's estimated that the bacterial cells that we house inside of us outnumber the amount of human cells that we have, which is really amazing. So that's a little bit about digestion and how to uh, ensure optimal digestion. And next we're going to get into some common issues that we as pianists uh, can suffer from and some things to try. So we'll see you then. Alright, so let's talk about joint and muscle health. Uh, this is obviously very important for us pianists. Um, and the most important thing to maintain joint and muscle health is uh, to eat a diet of properly prepared, nutrient-dense, real foods this is to supply both the nutrients for optimal joint and muscle health and also to prevent excessive inflammation that can cause problems with your joints and uh, with your muscles. So here are just a few of uh, the important nutrients that are needed uh, for optimal joint health. The first is water. Good quality pure water. Uh, this cushions your joints it flushes out toxins that can cause problems. It maintains the integrity of the cartilage, um, which is a substance that's very important for bone-to-bone -bone connection. Um, so it's very important uh, to have good hydration, uh, which we'll talk about some strategies a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, second thing to be getting from your diet is, is plenty of good amino acids from quality sources of protein. This is needed for collagen production and again you can refer to the macronutrient guidelines that I'll be uh, including with this presentation to uh, get some examples of good sources of protein. Um, third is antioxidants. These are uh, compounds found usually in plants that help to prevent excess damage, metabolic damage, to tissues. Um, they're found in some really delicious foods such as dark chocolate, blueberries, uh, red wine, walnuts, pomegranates, uh, many of the spices and herbs, turmeric, rose hips, um, basically anything that has a very strong color or flavor to it is going to have a good antioxidant content. Um, and then vitamin C is very important for collagen production as well. And you can, um, and collagen of course is the tissue that is very important for joint health. Surprisingly it's found uh, in, as I mentioned in the digestion portion, it's found in sauerkraut and cabbage and other vegetables. Um, it's also found in, in fruits, especially citrus fruits. And if you have access to it, it's found in the adrenal glands of animals. So if you eat organ meats, that's a good source of vitamin C. And then uh, the last one I'll mention is vitamin D, which is actually a, a hormone, uh, technically, but um, it's what we get from the sunlight. So getting enough sunlight actually is very important for your vitamin D status. Uh, I don't want you to get sunburned, but being out in the sun a little bit is actually very healthful. You can also find vitamin D from food sources such as fish and fish oil and um, other animal products. Okay, so those are some of the building blocks that we need for good joint and muscle health. Uh, now, sometimes we have too much inflammation, um, which can cause uh, pain in our, in our muscles and joints and interfere with the recovery period you know, after you work out and things like this. So one of the most important things to look at if you're experiencing excessive inflammation is your digestion. So go review back to review the action steps for good digestion in the previous segment um, to make sure that you're not contributing to excess inflammation through poor digestion. Um, the other part of the diet that's extremely important for inflammation is your fats, the dietary fats that you're taking in. Um, so 
We want to have a good mixture. Like I said, uh, that Weston A. Price discovered way back in the 30s, all these populations that had really great health, teeth health and otherwise, were eating an approximate 1 to 1 ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids, which is in contrast to what the typical diet now, which is maybe 15 or more times as much omega-6 fatty acid compared to omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, so the balance of those fats is really critical for your inflammatory and your anti-inflammatory healing responses to any injuries or insults. Um, too much of you know one type of fat, you're going to get excess inflammatory response, uh, which is problematic because it can cause you know inflammation in the joints. On the other hand, though, if we don't have enough inflammation, that can be a, a problem too because um, sometimes we do need to inflame. If there is an injury, that's what helps heal it. So it needs to be a balance. So um, in order to, to balance out those responses, one of the critical things is that fatty acid balance. So we want to have uh, approximately equal omega-3 to omega-6, if, if at all possible, at least 2 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. And sources of omega-3, omega-3 fatty acids are your fish, uh, essentially. So your wild-caught salmon, uh, herring, sardines, anchovies, um, cod liver oil is a good one, tuna, whitefish, cod, mackerel. These are all going to have some good omega-3 fatty acids. You can also find it from plant sources such as walnuts, chia seeds, uh, flax seeds. Uh, you can also get it from uh, pasture-raised egg yolks. And even grass-fed beef has some small amount of omega-3 fatty acids in it. Grain-fed beef does not usually have uh, uh, that type of fat. It usually has more of omega-6 fats. Um, now, one note about the plant versus animal sources of omega-3s. Uh, depending on your genetics or your nutritional status, you may be able to convert the, the animal sources better to, to the omega-3 um, fats that you need in your body to promote health. Um, it's easier to get those essential fatty acids from the animal sources than it is from the plant sources. Uh, so, and that depends on genetics and your status. Uh, the sources of omega-6 fatty acids are your vegetable oils, corn oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, uh, most, most other vegetable oils, sunflower, uh, sesame, pistachio nuts, pumpkin seeds. Um, so those we want to balance out. And, and again, if you look at all the labels on the processed food in the grocery store, you're going to see a lot of these things like canola oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, corn oil. So in general, if we're eating a processed food diet, if we're eating the standard American diet, the SAD diet, um, then we're getting many more omega-6 fatty acids. And it's not that those are necessarily bad, but it's just the balance is off. And we're, we're used to having a balance of omega-3 to omega-6. Um, we also need some other fats uh, that, that I'll mention in our diet to be optimally healthy. Those are omega-9. The, the omega-3 and omega-6, I should mention, are called polyunsaturated fats. Um, and the omega-9s are monounsaturated fats. These are things like olive oil, uh, avocado and avocado oil, almonds, uh, macadamia nuts. Uh, and then the fourth type of fat I'll mention that we do need to eat for a, a, a good balance of fats is saturated fats found from pasture-raised animals, grass-fed beef, organic virgin coconut oil, organic palm oil. These are all good sources of saturated fat. The fats to avoid are your toxic, uh, toxic fats. They're trans fats. Anything that says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils, uh, your processed vegetable oils that are found in clear plastic containers, um, your f most fried foods, unfortunately, um, are fried in, in fats that can easily be damaged by the, the heat, 
and then um, intersterified fats uh, that you'll see on labels high sterate or steric rich. These are fats uh, to be avoided at all costs. Um, I should also mention that there are some otherwise healthy fats that um, the, the polyunsaturated fats, omega-3 and omega-6, that have become rancid or damaged. Um, this is caused by exposure, too much exposure to light, air, or heat. Uh, this is why, you know, storing vegetable oils in clear plastic containers is a bad idea because it lets too much light hit those and damage the fats and make them not as healthful as they uh, would have been if they were kept in a cool, dark place. This is why frying at high temperatures with corn or peanut or even olive oil is unhealthy. This is why letting flaxseed oil out of the refrigerator and exposed to air ruins it. These, these um, polyunsaturated fats are very delicate. Um, they're from cold water fishes, right? So um, they're used to being at, at lower temperatures protected from light. Uh, so that's kind of the primer on fats. Very important for your inflammation status in your body. Um, and then I wanted to talk about uh, briefly about blood sugar and blood sugar regulation. I'll go more into detail in the next uh, in the next uh, segment. Uh, but keeping a balanced uh, blood sugar is very important for inflammation as well. Uh, for example, eating too many carbohydrates and especially too much sugar will cause your body to produce excess insulin and too much insulin promotes inflammation, uh, especially in the presence of omega-6 fatty acids like the vegetable oils. A high sugar diet can also uh, produce excessive compounds in your body called advanced glycation end products, otherwise known as AGE, uh, which spells age because <laughs> it, it does do damage to you, it prematurely ages your your tissues. Um, it's kind of like it's, this, it's uh, proteins that become sticky and causes things to stick together and, um, and uh, this can affect your joints as well. Uh, so again this is a theme of my presentation is to avoid a high sugar diet. It's, uh, it's not, not the way to health. Um, now I should mention that diet can potentially make you more resilient to a harmful piano technique, but you know, obviously you should go to the, the root cause, whatever it is, and if your root cause of, of joint and muscle pain is a poor technique with too much tension and uh, the like, then I would encourage you to address that as well. So here's your action steps for joint and muscle health. First, hydration. Drink enough good pure water. Um, two, eat a, a wide variety of unprocessed whole foods, um, bone broth, fermented foods, colorful vegetables, quality seafood and meat, uh, including organ meats if you can find them and tolerate them. Three, avoid a high carbohydrate diet, especially sugar, corn syrup, refined grains like white flour. Those things are, are not going to help your inflammation and your joint health. And then four, um, eating a, a healthy balance of omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, and saturated fats while avoiding the unhealthy fats like trans fats, hydrogenated fats, fried foods, and uh, the rancid fats that I mentioned. So those are your, your four action steps for good joint and, and muscle health. All right, we'll move on to energy and focus next. All right, so let's talk about energy and focus. These are obviously very important for the pianist, whether you're teaching or practicing or performing. We've got to have our, our brains working optimally, have enough energy to get through all this demanding activity. Uh, so here's a question. Where do we get our energy from? Um, well, food, obviously. Uh, and we break our food down into three... Um, it can be broken down into three macronutrients. Uh, from which we get energy. Fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, and we can get energy from each of those, although we mainly get our energy from fats and carbohydrates. 
uh, we're always utilizing some combination of fats and carbonate, carbohydrates for energy. Um, the intensity of the activity, as well as our metabolic flexibility, determines that ratio of fats to carbohydrates that we use for fuel. So um, low intensity activity, for example, like walking, uses more fat uh, than carbohydrates for fuel. While high intensity, sprinting, weightlifting, that type of thing, uses uh, more carbohydrate energy as fuel. Uh, Nora Gidgaudis, the author of the book Primal Fat Burner, uh, describes fats um, as big logs on our metabolic fire. Uh, you know, the logs provide a steady, long-term burning source of fuel. Uh, carbohydrates she describes more as like kindling on the fire. You know, they are good for quick bursts uh, where we need a lot of heat, uh, but they die out fairly quickly as well. And then we've got sugar or alcohol, which are like gasoline on the fire. They provide a big boost of energy real quick, but then soon after the, the flame dies down and you need to add more to the fire to keep it going. Now, what is piano playing? Is it high intensity, low intensity? It's, you know, probably for most people it's closer to the low intensity spectrum, although I've broken a sweat playing piano, depending on the composer, of course. Um, and so it's, it's low depending on the, the repertoire and the conditions, you know, if you're in a really hot place, maybe it's more intense. But uh, depending on the conditions, you know, low to medium intense activity, which means that we can be burning plenty of fat uh, for energy during piano playing as our main source of fuel. Uh, we're not, you know, weightlifting or sprinting, uh, which would require more of a carbohydrate type of boost. Um, now, the, the other determinant of whether or not we can burn f a lot of fat for our energy is our metabolic flexibility. So how do we improve that? How do we improve our body's ability to burn both carbohydrates and fats for energy? Well, um, for one, we can eat plenty of healthy fats, which I've mentioned earlier the sources of. Uh, we can avoid um, high sugar, again, that's a theme, uh, and I avoid high, uh, what's called high glycemic foods, which um, tend to spike your blood sugar. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, we can practice intermittent fasting, which I will also explain in a second here. Uh, we can do endurance training, that's been shown to improve metabolic flexibility. Um, and then, of course, we can just eat a, a, a nutrient-dense whole foods diet, uh, avoid a lot of processed foods. So let's talk about this intermittent th fasting. Uh, first, I just want to mention, it's interesting to note, our body stores energy in various places. Um, our glycogen storage, which is the carbohydrate energy that we store in our muscles and our liver, primarily, we have a, um, several thousand calories worth of uh, glycogen storage in our body, um, which can last for you know a, a day or a few days. Now contrast that with our fat storage. Even lean people uh, without a lot of excess body fat have tens of thousands of calories, if not you know a hundred thousand or more calories of. Um, energy stored in your fat on your body you know uh, so that's that's uh, how many days is that so if you have a 2,000 calorie day 50 days worth of energy just stored in your body fat so it's a it's a lot of energy there if you can tap into it um, which brings up uh, intermittent fasting this is uh, also referred to as time-restricted eating sometimes uh, this is when you limit your eating to a certain time window each day. So for example, a beginner might start out um, eating in a 12-hour window every day. So you would wake up, you know, eat um, breakfast at 8 o'clock and then eat your meals and then finish dinner by 8 p.m. and then don't eat again until the next morning at 8. So you have 12 hours of fasting where you're only drinking water, not eating food. Uh, and then you, you know, if you get more acclimated to this and want to try more, uh, you get a little more benefits if you restrict it even further. So if you eat all of your 
meals in like say a six hour window delay breakfast till noon finish dinner by 6 p.m. and then you're getting um, 18 hours of time when you're fasting the rest of the time and that can have a lot of benefits this is a time when your body is not worried about digesting things so it can focus on things like repair regeneration um, and uh, this also uses up your glycogen stores the carbohydrate energy sources in your body and sends a signal to your body I better start relying more on my fat stores for energy um, and this has been studied recently quite a bit and it's been shown to uh, help with things like inflammation uh, obesity heart health brain health it's been shown to help with you know delay onset of Alzheimer's um, it also increases the process called autophagy which in essence means eating yourself uh, auto meaning yourself and phagy meaning eating and it's where your body takes kind of old older not as efficient cells and recycles them basically it eats them and makes way for newer more efficient cells and this is great also for uh, cancer because autophagy can kind of start recycling cancer cells before they can before they can proliferate so intermittent fasting is has the potential to be a really game a game changer in terms of health and it's great for building your metabolic flexibility because you're practicing going without food for longer periods of time signaling your body to burn more fat as energy um, and of course before you begin any fasting regimen be sure to talk with your official health care ally um, for you know just to, to track that to, to make sure it's uh, right for you so let's talk about blood sugar balance shall we uh, carbohydrates they're found in foods such as grains like bread pasta rice corn these types of things uh, they're found in starches potatoes squash beans lentils sweet potatoes and they're found in sugars of course um, fruit soft drinks cakes candies pies can uh, cookies any other sweet things um, now some carbohydrates make your blood sugar go up faster and higher than others these are called the high glycemic carbohydrates uh, lower glycemic carbohydrates on the other hand are, are carbohydrates that don't make your blood sugar go up very fast or, or very much um, higher glycemic carbs are things like white bread sugar cereal and sugar in general uh, potatoes um, lower glycemic carbs are things like non starchy vegetables lentils carrots apples uh, and you can easily find lists of glycemic index for foods on the internet um, when we eat a carbohydrate our body starts to break it down into simple sugars that can be ab absorbed into our bloodstream uh, and then go on to fuel the body's cells uh, now insulin is secreted by the pancreas to allow glucose to go into the cells it's kind of like the gate the, the key that opens the cells to allow glucose in um, this also serves to make sure that our blood uh, does not get too sugary because that can be very dangerous if our blood sugar goes up too high it's very dangerous that uh, that's what happens in, in diabetes type 2 diabetes um, so our insulin prevents the sugar from going too high now if we stress our blood sugar handling system which is which is our pancreas it's our adrenal glands it's our liver um, if we stress these organs with a continually high uh, carbohydrate diet and uh, sugary meals and that type of thing uh, we can experience what's called hypoglycemia which is low blood sugar uh, it's kind of counterintuitive because you think you eat a lot of sugar and your blood sugar would go up well that's true it does go up and the faster your blood sugar goes up the more your body wants to produce insulin so that it doesn't go too high because again going too high is, is dangerous and, and bad for your body so it your body says this is dangerous I need to produce a lot of insulin that consequently makes your blood sugar go way down 
right? So it's kind of a boomerang effect, a roller coaster, if you will. And your blood sugar goes up, insulin makes it go way down, you get cravings, you want to, you're, now your body's saying, my blood sugar's too low, I need to eat. Um, so you eat a bunch of, you know, donuts or whatever you crave, you know, chips, uh, chocolate, blood sugar goes up, insulin makes it go down, and it's this roller coaster. Um, now, if we chronically do this day in and day out, what happens is that our cells will be eventually become resistant to insulin. This is called insulin resistance. Um, there's so much insulin floating around that the cells are just like, that's too much, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm desensitized to the effects of insulin. So you need more insulin to get the same effect. Now, stress, including, you know, being chased by a saber-toothed tiger or performing piano music in front of an audience, uh, this causes our adrenal glands to kick in. These are the adrenal glands are above the kidneys. They are the emergency, the fight or flight kind of organs that help with us in a crisis situation. Now, uh, having too high or too low of blood sugar is a crisis to the body. So it causes the adrenals to fire, especially when our blood sugar gets too low and we're not eating, that our adrenals start firing to raise our blood sugar up. So if we're kind of bombarding our adrenal glands from both angles of uh, being stressed out by eating a high glycemic diet and also being stressed out in other areas of our life, then our poor adrenal glands can uh, get tired out and we, we have symptoms such as anxiety, depression, tiredness, even sexual dysfunction because they're involved with some of the sexual hormones. So it's not good news. Um, so some other symptoms uh, of blood sugar dysregulation are um, in the morning if you have a hard time waking up, if you're not feeling rested, if you have no appetite in the morning, or conversely if you have strong cravings for things like sugar and caffeine in the morning to get going. Um, and then after lunch, if you have an energy drop after lunch, you, know, you want to go take a nap. Uh, if you have cravings in the afternoon, relying on stimulants to get through the day. Um, and then at night, if you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, these can all be signs of uh, blood sugar dysregulation. So we got to keep in mind that, that our, our metabolism was built to uh, rely on both carbohydrates and fats, and uh, maybe even primarily fats. Uh, so, unfortunately we kind of live in a culture which is a sugar-burning culture. Uh, we eat a lot of carbohydrates, high glycemic carbohydrates, and that turns off our fat-burning signals of our body. It's like, okay, we got plenty of carbs, let's just use that for energy, and we don't rely on the fat as much. So, uh, we want to try to become as met metabolically flexible as possible. Uh, I've included in the resources to this presentation the macronutrient uh, fine-tuning quiz as well, which can kind of, you can uh, consult that to see if you are eating a proper ratio of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and how to tweak it and what good examples of uh, food choices are. So you can check that out. Um, but here's the action step for your energy and your focus. Uh, because your blood sugar regulation is intimately connected with how, it, how you're able to have energy levels and how you're able to focus. So here's the action step. Work on your metabolic flexibility. Uh, this is the ability to burn fats as well as carbohydrates for energy. Um, and the, the way to do this is by eating plenty of healthy fats, avoiding sugar and other high glycemic uh, foods, Intermittent fasting, if that's appropriate uh, for you and your health status. Endurance training. Again, consult your healthcare ally before embarking on any big change in your routine. And then uh, just eating a nutrient-dense whole foods diet, avoiding the processed foods. So that, those are some steps you can take to improve your, your energy and your focus levels. Okay, next we're going to talk about performance anxiety. We'll see you there. Welcome to my kitchen. Uh, I'm going to show you how to make chicken bone broth, which is a nourishing liquid that I think all musicians uh, need to be consuming regularly. 
I will be loosely following the recipe from this book, Nourishing Traditions, by Sally Fallon Morell, which is a wonderful book full of many great recipes um, and a lot of good nutrition uh, information as well. But you really don't need a recipe for bone broth. Um, it's a flexible endeavor. Um, I'm going to be making mine in a stock pot on the stove, but you can use a um, slow cooker or a pressure cooker if you have one as well. Uh, many cultures have had different um, traditions and recipes that they've used, but the basic idea for bone broth is you take animal bones, uh, put them in a pot with water and vegetables, and simmer that for many hours. Um, the keys, there's a couple of important keys for, for doing this. First of all, get the best quality ingredients that you possibly can. Uh, for water, uh, <laughs> the kitty cat. <laughs> uh, for water, uh, if you happen to live next to a pure natural spring, that would be ideal. Uh, uh, at least use filtered water. I'll be using filtered water. Uh, for the chicken, ideally you, you need to use uh, pasture-raised, um, organic, uh, free-range chicken, and uh, use vegetables that are, are not grown with uh, pesticides. Um, another tip is to um, soak your bones before you start simmering them, soak them in cold water with a, a tablespoon or two of vinegar. It helps to draw out the, the uh, collagen and gelatin from the bones. Uh, and then finally, simmer it for many hours. Uh, so now I will show you uh, what materials and ingredients you'll need for this recipe. Alright, so our ingredients. First of all, the star of the show is the chicken. Uh, I'm using a whole chicken. Um, it's a stewing hen, which um, means it's a, it was an egg layer that stopped laying eggs and has crossed over to its next phase, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but you can use whatever you have on hand. If you roasted a whole chicken and you have leftover bones, you can use those. If you had wing night, you can keep a little stash in your freezer of the bone, leftover bones from that. Uh, until you have collected, you know, a, a good portion to make broth with, um, uh, whatever you whatever you want to do. And then, very important, um, we've got two chicken feet and a chicken head. Um, luckily, we live next to a or around a, a farm that sells these items. Um, the chicken feet, especially, are very important for adding a lot of that nice collagen and gelatin to the broth, which is really great for supporting your joint health. And then we've got these vegetables, and the vegetables are optional, but they uh, add a lot of minerals to your broth. Onion, celery, carrots. Um, you really can add whatever you have on hand, you know, the carrot tops, if you have them, the leaves of the celery, uh, whatever you want. And then we've got the water, of course, a gallon of filtered water. And then uh, I'm using apple cider vinegar for the uh, acid source. And then we've got our stock pot and uh, a strainer and a bowl for after it's finished. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to take our chicken. It has the neck on it. You can have the giblets, too, if you have them. This one does not have them. But we'll put that in the pot, uh, chicken feet, and the head. Um, and then we're going to cover with, uh, as I said, about a gallon of water, enough to cover it all. Add a little more water. Uh, 
eventually. Uh, and then a couple tablespoons of vinegar. No need to measure, just throw it in. So we're gonna let that sit for about uh, 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Now in the meantime, while we're letting that soak, we can start rough cutting our vegetables. And the fun thing about this is that uh, you don't really need to worry too much about being precise. You can even leave the skin on your onion because it's all gonna be uh, strained out at the end. So you can just kind of roughly chop your onion like this. All right, so we've got a, a nice boil coming um, to a head here, and uh, some scum might arise to the top, so you're gonna skim the scum, like so. Gets rid of any impurities in the chicken. Just kinda skim that off as it comes to a boil. Once you have most of the scum skimmed off, you can add the veggies. All right. And you're going to turn this down so that it's just barely simmering. Uh, put the lid on and simmer for at least six hours. Some recipes I've seen go to 48 hours. Um, the longest I have simmered it has been for 24 hours, I believe. And it created this amazing chicken jello uh, when I refrigerated it after straining it, which was disgusting looking, but delicious tasting. Um, so at least six hours to get a good amount of the nutrients out. Um, and if you're going to simmer it overnight, uh, make sure that you um, have a lid on it and that you're keeping an eye on it you know, when you can. Um, there was one instance where I must have had the lid you know, a, to askew and left it overnight uh, only to wake up to a charred, smoldering mess in my pot that all the, the water had boiled off and that was a sad day. So don't do that <laughs> and also recommend don't have anything uh, flammable around your stovetop if you're gonna leave it overnight. Um, so now we just let it simmer and let the magic happen. So I'll see you back here in many hours. <laughs> all right, welcome back. It's been about 22 hours of simmering. Uh, the house smells amazing, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, strain this broth. Uh, I ended up getting our other stock pot, because that uh, can hold it all instead of the bowl. So, here goes nothing. I hope I don't make a big mess. There you have it. Rich, nutritious chicken bone broth. Let's see how this tastes. Okay, so, performance anxiety. Uh, now, of course, 
many factors go into performance anxiety. I'm not claiming that it's all your diet or nutrition. Uh, you know, of course, preparation levels, uh, there's m mental um, facets, breathing, imagery, meditation, these, all these things can help. Um, but for the nutrition side of things, um, I wanted to mention a, a few things to consider if you're struggling with excessive performance anxiety, like I did when I was a younger pianist. Um, stimulants like coffee, uh, caffeine, nicotine, uh, it, this is something to explore and to pay attention to if you partake in these types of uh, substances. Uh, I had one pianist tell me that if he had a, cig a cigarette he smoked, um, and I do not encourage you to smoke, obviously, um, he smoked and drank, drank coffee. He said if he had his coffee and his cigarette uh, too um, close to his performance, it increases anxiety, but it also increases anxiety if you get too far away. If you get an optimal timing uh, about an hour away. And again, don't smoke and try to quit if you are. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, I occasionally partake in the coffee and definitely have had to experiment with how it affects my performance anxiety levels, jitteriness. Of course, caffeine can cause excess jitteriness if you're not adapted to it. Um, and it can cause things like sweaty palms, heart rate, all these types of things that can exacerbate your anxiety. So just pay attention, I would encourage you. Um, and then the other thing to pay attention to is, of course, the pre-performance meal, and especially its macronutrient uh, ratios, so how much carbohydrate, fat, and protein content that meal has. Uh, uh, and then <laughs> whether or not you even eat a, a meal. You know, I've had pianists that say, uh, if I skip my dinner before my concert, my anxiety is really bad, so I need to eat something. On the other hand, uh, Louis Armstrong always skipped his dinner, apparently, and uh, Glenn Gould, I read, he uh, said that fasting um, sharpened his mind. So, you know, everyone has their own routine. I encourage you to just tune into yours and find out what works, try it out, um, and try to hone that, that aspect. Um, Personally, I eat a, uh, I try to eat a balanced meal, you know, with with um, good proteins and fats, not overly high in carbohydrates. Um, eggs are a perfect food for me personally. Uh, not, I don't eat a big meal, but uh, it is fairly wholesome. Um, eggs and uh, you know salad, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so. Let's go to the foundations to see how each of them can uh, interact with performance anxieties, starting with blood sugar balance. Um, coincidentally, some of the symptoms of uh, blood sugar dysregulation are anxiety and depression. So, you know, be sure to refer to the previous segment uh, about blood sugar and use the macronutrient fine tuning quiz uh, to. to assess if you're eating a good ratio of fats to carbohydrates to proteins. Um, and then your adrenal gland health. I kind of mentioned this uh, in the energy section before. Um, they're supposed to be used in an emergency uh, for fight or flight. Uh, and, you know, the piano recital does trigger that response in most of us. <laughs> um, but, you know, as I mentioned, imbalanced blood sugar is also an emergency for your body. So. You know, if they're being taxed in both ways, that's, that's um, a recipe for your adrenals being overwhelmed. And this kind of can result in a situation where you feel really keyed up, but you're also kind of sluggish and, uh, uh, you know, not 100% focused. You're kind of agitated, but not energetic, if that makes sense. I, I, I've definitely felt this before, um, and that can be caused by a, a blood sugar dysregulation. Um, I just want to tell you a quick story about a colleague, uh, a fellow student when I was in grad school. He was in the same studio, so I got to hear him refine and hone his repertoire for his uh, recital uh, every week in the studio class. And he was playing it fantastic. He was just a wonderful 
uh, pianist playing some really great repertoire. And so finally his re recital day came, and I was excited to hear him play. And the uh, first half was just fantastic, you know. It was almost perfect. It, it was beautiful, expressive, he was comfortable at the keyboard. Um, just a wonderful piano recital. Uh, and then intermission happened. And the second half, it was like he was a different person. Um, and he was seemed uncomfortable. He was, he was a little more shaky. He was having a lot of memory slips. And this is all repertoire that I had heard him play really successfully in CEO class. So it wasn't necessarily that these were less prepared pieces. Uh, and so I was just thinking, this is curious. So afterwards, you know, I went backstage and congratulated him. And, uh, and he had mentioned, he's like, yeah, at, at intermission, I just got super hungry. And, um, you know, for my, my uh, uh, after, after the recital party, I have all this cake and orange juice. And so I just grabbed, it, you know, like two or three pieces of cake and scarfed it down and, and drank a couple glasses of orange juice because I was just starving at intermission. And um, this was what, one of the first moments where my where the light bulb went off, and I said, "Huh, uh, maybe you know what we eat and, and the foods we choose do have an effect on our our musical performance." Um, and so uh, I definitely suspect there was some blood sugar swings that contributed to his his performance uh, turning out the way it did. Um, so. Uh, there, that's you know, a big one to look at is blood sugar regulation. The other one is uh, I wanted to go into more depth uh, in this segment is hydration. You know, I haven't talked much about water, um, but it's super important. You know, uh, I think I mentioned we're 60 to 70 percent water by weight, but if you look at the molecules of our body, the number of molecules. We are 98.9 percent, approximately, water molecules, which is, I mean, unbelievable. They're small, so they, they make up a lot. Of, they're not, you know, um, as much of the weight, but by number, I mean, wow. So they do a lot, in other words, um, and we need to have enough water uh, to take in enough water to allow us to be healthy. Symptoms of dehydration are anxiety. Feeling uneasy, jitteriness, you know, these are all, all symptoms of dehydration. So if you're, you're experiencing a little performance anxiety and then you add dehydration on top of it, it could put you over the edge from, you know, something that you could handle in a performance to just something that derails it completely. Um, so uh, a general guideline for how much water you should drink is take your weight in pounds, divide it by two, and that's the number of ounces you should aim to drink in a day of good, clean, pure water. So for example, if you weigh 160 pounds, uh, divided by 280, aim for 80 ounces a day. Um, not to exceed 100 ounces, um, or else you start risking flushing out too many minerals. Uh, now, the sources of water. This is a, a tricky one. Uh, we live in a a world where the tap water is not necessarily the cleanest thing. You know, it's got chlorine, it's got fluoride, it's got other contaminants from prescription drugs and pollutants and, you know, they do filter it but it's maybe not perfect so it's got these remnants in it that we have to try to avoid if we want to get the best water. The best source of water, kind of like food, is wild water <laughs> uh, which comes from a, a spring, a pure spring. So if you can find a pure spring water source in your area, that would be the best water to collect. Um, the resource I would point you to is called findaspring.com. It's a listing of all these sources. Uh, and uh, just make sure that it's been tested recently for contaminants, for pollutants, and for agricultural runoff and that type of thing. But if you can find a pure spring, that's the most hydrating water. Um, Second to that is is uh, filtering your water in some way. You know, people use reverse osmosis or um, this uh, distilled water, that type of thing. Uh, I personally use a Berkey filter uh, um, that I then add either like some lemon or just a tiny pinch of sea salt to add some good minerals to the water. It's got to be free. Your water really should be free from 
any agricultural or industrial or other types of pollutants. Um, now, if you're drinking plenty of water, but you're still not quite feeling hydrated, um, you might explore these other types of things uh, about water that, that, that simulate the spring water that you, you would get from a nice wild spring. Uh, and these are, um, I should mention, uh, in addition to um, spring water, another great source of water, if you can find it, is cold mountain stream where it's not been polluted, it's uh, running, you know, over you know, in a stream, it's, there's no, no contaminants. Um, so, so these are the things that you can do to simulate that. Um, the first is you might be getting enough water but uh, not have the, the electrolyte minerals that are necessary for the water to be utilized by your body. And so to remedy this, you might try adding some trace mineral, mineral drops to your water. Uh, or um, what's called a quinton solution, which is a concentrated um, seawater you know, based on a theory that our optimal blood plasma and, and seawater have a very similar mineral concentration. Or, you know, simply a pinch, like I do, simply a pinch of sea salt, unrefined sea salt to your water. Uh, you can also try the supplements Shilajit, that's S-H-I-L-A-J-I-T or fulvic acid. Um, these are both sources of trace miner minerals that you can add to your, your diet. Um, and then if you're still you know, suffering from this problem, drinking enough water but feeling dehydrated, uh, you can look into something I'm just starting to dip my toes into, which is structuring your water through a vortex or have it be in motion some way, because that's the natural way it comes out of a spring or in a, a cold stream is it's in motion. Um, and I know this sounds a little bit out there, but appreciating your water uh, may have an effect. You know, there's uh, the work of Dr. Emoto, E-M-O-T-O, e uh, showed that positive intentions can change the structure of the water. So uh, if that is something that you accept, uh, it can't hurt. Um, and then another thing that I recently learned about, about being hydrated is um, the electrical health of our body. Uh, and if our, if our cells are not properly um, basically grounded, then we can't utilize the water in the same way. Uh, so things to work on, uh, or things that would help this area are grounding, which is basically just going barefoot on the earth. Uh, you know, try for 45 minutes, three times a week, and see if that uh, helps out, you feeling more hydrated. And then getting sunlight on your skin. Again, I mentioned the vitamin D, but this also helps with, uh, with your electrical health of your body. So uh, this, this may help your, your body structure the water inside of it better, and you might feel more hydrated that way. Um, and then one thing that's kind of overlooked in hydration is the foods you eat. Watery vegetables and fruits are wonderful sources of hydration because the water is already in a good structured form in them. Um, chia seeds, if you soak chia seeds, they, they develop this gel-like uh, substance, very hydrating. Um, and then finally, eating uh, the good fats sources that I've mentioned, um, in fact, is a, is a hydrating uh, thing to do as well, having the, the, fat, the good fats in your, in your diet. Um, Okay, so that's hydration. The next thing about performance anxiety I'll mention is um, digestion. You know, of course, digestion is really important. Uh, you need to be getting these um, amino acids that are the building blocks of neurotransmitters, uh, as well as vitamins and hormones. So for example, tryptophan. It's a precursor to serotonin, um, which promotes calm and reduces anxiety. Uh, we can get tryptophan from Poultry, you know, the famous turkey example is one of them. Uh, tuna, beef, lamb, halibut, shrimp, salmon, snapper, these are all good sources of tryptophan. Uh, the large intestines are the primary location for the creation of serotonin, which again uh, promotes calm, reduces anxiety. Uh, so refer back to those action steps for good digestion. 
uh, to make sure your microbiome especially is in balance and that those friendly bacteria in your gut can help you make enough serotonin. We also need optimal vitamin B6 levels. Uh, B6 uh, levels, uh, B6 can be found in uh, bell peppers, uh, turnip greens, spinach, bananas, uh, soaked and sprouted grains, tuna, chicken, liver, cod, uh, and other seafood and, and meat products. Uh, and avoiding high alcohol is another way to keep your B6 stores up because alcohol can deplete those. Um, we also need to have our detoxification pathways open so that uh, you know toxins aren't accumulating in our body, which can exacerbate anxiety symptoms. Uh, so we need to be drinking plenty of water. Uh, we need to be eliminating at least once a day um, with a good bowel movement, not too runny or too constipated feeling, uh, at least once a day. You know, if you're going two or three times a day, that's still well within a normal range and could actually be helpful in some cases. Uh, and again, you can try supporting your digestion with things like beet juice to support your bile production, uh, digestive bitters, things like that. All right, so that's uh, performance anxiety. I'll, I'll uh, finish up here with the action steps. First, we've got hone your pre-performance routine and rituals so that you're eating a meal um, that helps you personally, doesn't make you uncomfortable during your performance. Um, refer to is refer back to the macronutrient guidelines um, to help ensure that you're supporting your blood sugar, your optimal blood sugar levels um, by eating a diet with a good proportion of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Uh, especially pay attention to, if you're eating too many carbohydrates because that can uh, that can exacerbate the, the uh, anxiety. Three is to drink enough good water and explore ways to hydrate better if needed by filtering your water, adding uh, trace minerals, seeking out a natural spring, uh, etc. And then four, work on your digestive health. Again, that, the importance of digestion in all these things is, is paramount. Uh, make sure you're digesting those nutrients needed for good mental health um, and eliminating the toxins uh, that could be contributing to excessive anxiety. All right, so uh, we will come back with immunity after this. So I, I next wanted to talk about the immune system uh, and a problem that many of us pianists face, which is getting sick uh, often getting colds and flus and having to cancel lessons and interfering with our practice time. Um, and so I wanted to begin with just a little bit about the philosophy, what we think about, about getting sick, right? Um, and so I wanted to go through a couple of um, ways of looking at it. Uh, the first is called germ theory. And this is the dominant paradigm that we're living in today. Uh, and this is the idea that the most important reason for us getting sick is that there's a certain pathogen that comes from the outside of our body and it gets into our body somehow. It invades and reproduces and makes us sick. Bacteria, virus, whatever it is, can get in, get in, attack us, and make us sick. Now, there is another way of looking at things um, called uh, many things, but terrain theory is one of the names of it. And that's the idea that the most important part of whether or not we, we get sick is our internal environment and how resilient we are. You know, it's, it says we assume that there's all types of uh, bacteria and viruses floating around out there that could potentially cause us harm. Uh, but the most important thing is to focus on how resilient we are uh, so that they can't gain a foothold inside of our bodies. Now, I think both of those viewpoints have their merits, um, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to explore the terrain theory a little bit more, especially in terms of how we think of our body when it gets sick. Um, and the question, are symptoms bad, right? Uh, what if we considered symptoms to be our body intelligently repairing itself? 
For instance, um, coughing. That's, you know, your body, there's something in your lungs that's irritating it that it needs to get out. Um, your body doesn't need inside of its lung tissue anymore, so you're coughing, getting things out. Fever. Um, fever is making the fluids of the body more uh, uh, able to flow better so that they can be expelled. Whatever's in there that's causing the fever can be let out of the body. Uh, a rash, for instance, is toxins or some unwanted poison in the body coming out of the skin. Uh, diarrhea and vomiting, that's when you have something that you, your body doesn't want, it's, it's imbalanced inside and it's coming out of your bowels or your, or your mouth. Um, or your stomach, I should say. Uh, swelling is another good example. Swelling, um, when you have an injury, swelling allows more cells that can help heal the injury, allow it, it allows more cells into that area. So kind of looking at symptoms not as something terrible to be avoided, but as just part of the process of your body coming back to homeostasis. And trying to adopt this, this view of symptoms actually has helped my anxiety when I do get sick. Uh, it's helped me to kind of more support the body and feel, not feel like I'm broken and this is wrong, but just give it time, this will all, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Um, so it's, it's helped my anxiety when I do get sick. And I don't, I don't get too sick often anymore um, since I changed my diet, but um, I still occasionally, you know, need to get something out, it seems like. So looking at it in this way, it was very helpful for me. Um, so let's get into the foundations. How do we not get sick too often? Uh, the top foundation, of course, is digestion. Uh, digest the digestive system, the gut, is home to about 70 to 80 percent of our immune system, actually. So we need to have good digestive health. So be sure to refer back to the, the digestive section on those action steps on how to, how to maintain good digestive health. The, the, the one, the, or the two, um, the two areas I would suggest you focus on is one is stomach acid. Recall that that's the barrier. Uh, if you have not enough stomach acid, then things can come in, you swallow um, microbes that can then become out of balance with the rest of your, your system. If you have a good, robust stomach acid, then those aren't going to you know, get in as much. Um, and then the microbiome in general, uh, especially in your large intestine. We want to take care of that. Stomach acid will help, but also eating fermented foods uh, and increasing your microbiome diversity uh, in the ways I've mentioned before. This will um, help you to not only not get as sick as much, but also to avoid things like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, food allergies, candida overgrowth, all these types of things that are associated with imbalanced microbiome. Um, the second foundation that's really important for immune health is your blood sugar balance. Um, consistently high blood sugar uh, depresses your white blood cell activity um, and actually depresses the immune system in general. Um, so eating a diet that's high in, in sugar and processed carbohydrates like white bread, pizza, donuts, cakes, candy, mashed potatoes, all these uh, really delicious foods, um, but eating too much of those will depress your immune system, unfortunately. And of course, you know, I, I hate to be the food police, but, uh, and I do enjoy some of those foods occasionally, but I do re also realize that they don't help my immune system. So in the winter time when people around me are starting to get sick, uh, I make sure I, I'm not eating too much sugar and that helps me to stay resistant. Um, and, uh, Check out the resource, the macronutrient uh, fine-tuning quiz on, in the resources section. Um, but some clues to know if you are not handling uh, your carbohydrates optimally in your diet, if you might be eating too many carbohydrates and too many sugars, uh, some of the symptoms you may be experiencing are um, being hungry, craving sweets, 
one, two or three hours after a meal, uh, or experiencing a big energy drop, drowsiness, getting jittery or shaky after a meal, you know, an hour or two after a meal, uh, feeling slow or sluggish, or having trouble focusing, or on the other hand, feeling hyper anxious or obsessive or irritable after meals. These are clues to say that your, your macronutrient ratio is not optimal for your, your particular system. Um, the third uh, important foundation to look at for immune health is hydration. Um, drinking enough water not only keeps your air passages moist, uh, but it supports your lymphatic flow, which is kind of like your body's garbage collectors in a way. Um, it promotes proper blood viscosity, so things can flow in your body where they need to go. And a little side note, um, breathing through your nose actually is very important. Uh, the hairs and the mucus in your nose are amazing debris collectors and uh, they provide a wonderfully efficient barrier system for bacteria, viruses, other things that may be coming in. Um, and drinking enough good water is essential for making a moist enough uh, mucous membrane in your nose so that that works very well. Um, so that's that. Uh, and then let's talk about mineral balance and other nutrients that are needed for a high-functioning immune system. Uh, calcium is important. Um, supports white blood cell activity. You can find that in green vegetables, in bone broth, in almonds, Brazil nuts, uh, dairy of course, um, and beans. Vitamin D is essential for the immune system and for many other things, but, but particularly for your immune health. Um, it's also needed for optimal calcium utilization. Vitamin D is best gotten through the sun. So again, don't get sunburned, but uh, it's, it's good when the sun's out to get some sun on your skin. Uh, it's also found in food sources such as pastured egg yolks, cod liver oil, salmon. Uh, you can even um, leave out certain types of mushrooms like cremini mushrooms and portobello mushrooms. If you leave those out in the sun for a few days, and cover them at night, but let them let the sun um, shine on them for a few days. They become powerhouses of dietary vitamin D, and I'll include a, a link to this article I read recently on on that process of basically making your own vitamin D supplements using mushrooms. Uh, zinc is another nutrient that is really important for your immune system. It also is important for wound healing. Uh, you can find it in oysters and liver, pumpkin seeds and pecans, or pecans, depending on how you like to say that. Uh, vitamin A is another one, uh, very important, especially for viral balance in your, your system. Again, liver is a great source of vitamin A, whole eggs, full fat milk, um, any of the r colorful vegetables, red, orange, green, yellow vegetables, uh, grass-fed butter red palm oil, those are all great sources of vitamin A. Uh, copper and iodine are very important for immune health. Um, copper you can find in liver also. Oysters, spirulina, uh, dark chocolate, shiitake mushroom, sesame seeds. Iodine is found in a lot of seafood and seaweed. Um, and in salt. They're, they put synthetic iodine in most table salt. Um, vitamin C is a big immune system uh, booster as well, and it helps with free radicals uh, that uh, can otherwise damage your system. Fresh, fresh and raw fruits and vegetables are a good source of vitamin C. Um, sauerkraut, which I'll be showing you how to make or have already showed you depending on where that comes. I, I, I'm forgetting that. But uh, organ meats, especially, you know, this might be a little strange to eat these things, but if you can find adrenal glands, thymus, and lung, uh, those are organ meats that concentrate vitamin C. Um, head cheese is a product that has, I think, some of those in it. Uh, squash and other non-starch, uh, or non-grain starches have vitamin C. Um, and then the two things that reduce your vitamin C levels are smoking and 
eating excessive sugar and, and refined grains. So those will deplete you of vitamin C. So those are some of the minerals and other nutrients that are needed for a, a robust, healthy immune system. Um, and ideally, if you're eating a, a nice nutrient-dense whole foods diet, like we've been talking about, you will get those uh, through your diet and won't need to supplement. Um, although, uh, you know, our soils are are becoming more depleted of certain nutrients, so occasionally supplementation might be recommended. Re uh, recommended. Uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, healthy fats are also important for immune health, uh, especially the, the appropriate mix of those omega-3 to omega-6 because that um, helps with our inflammation and our anti-inflammation, keeping that in balance, uh, which is really important for our immune system. So, uh, refer back to the joints and muscle uh, section for good sources of omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, and saturated fats, and for the, the fats to avoid, the trans fats, hydrogenated oils. Um, so that, those are the, the foundations. Um, I'll just summarize the, the five action steps for good immune system health. We've got, number one, work on your, your digestive system, especially optimal stomach acid levels. Uh, two, avoid a high sugar diet. Three, keep hydrated with plenty of good pure water. Four, eat a whole foods nutrient dense diet and get out in the sun when you uh, can to provide those needed vitamins and minerals for optimal uh, immunity. And then five, eat a good balance of um, healthy dietary fats. All right, welcome back to the kitchen. I'm gonna show you how to make sauerkraut. Uh, this is a wonderfully probiotic food, nutrient rich. Uh, you're going to need some cabbage. You're going to need a knife to cut it up. You're going to need a container to put it in, maybe some bowls, uh, and then salt. That's all you're going to need. So let's get started oh. chopping this up. All right, so the first step is to core the cabbage. So I'm just going to cut it in half here. Cut out the core, like so. Get rid of that. And the other side. And how thick you chop it is kind of your uh, choice. You know, thinner it will draw out the water from the cabbage quicker, but thicker can be good too if you prefer that texture in your final product. Uh, so now I'm just going to going to chop it um, and I'll aim for pretty thin. First I'll just remove a couple of these outer browner leaves. Okay. Alright, so here we go. That's ah, so tedious. I think I'll just do this a little bit faster. Okay, now we're just going to put it in uh, a bowl, and I put a little bit in the bowl, and then add a little bit of our salt, sprinkle it over, put a little more, sprinkle a little more salt. This cabbage turned out to be around two pounds, so I use two teaspoons of salt per pound, um, so it's about four teaspoons of salt. Just sprinkling it over. The amount of salt you use kind of is, is up to you again, what taste you like. The more salt, um, the slower the fermentation, and uh, vice versa. Um, the purpose of the salt is not only to create a good environment for fermentation, but also to help draw out the moisture from the cabbage, uh, because that's important. We want to ferment this uh, under its own juices. So the salt helps draw out the juices. Okay, so we've got... Uh, just put the rest of the salt here and mix it up. Actually, I might split this into two bowls so I can do my mixing. So we got two bowls, put more salt, mix it around. 
put in more salt, mix it around, okay. So after chopping, the other three steps of making sauerkraut are to salt it, which I just did. Um, and by the way, you can use any salt you really want. I'm using a, a sea salt. Um, and depending on the temperature, uh, the ambient temperature, if it's really hot out, you might um, use a little more salt to slow it down. Uh, if it's colder, you can use a little less salt to kind of make sure it doesn't slow it down too much because the coldness or the hotness of your environment will uh, determine the length of fermentation as well. All right, so then the next step is to, to squeeze the cabbage, kind of bruise it a little bit. Again, we want it to be sweating out water. And this will take uh, a few minutes, you know, it might take 10, 20 minutes before all the water comes out. Um, some people have wooden pounders that they use when they pack it in to help the water come out even more. So I'll be back when the uh, cabbage starts sweating a little bit and uh, we'll continue. So as we're waiting here for the uh, water to be drawn out of the cabbage by the salt, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the health benefits of sauerkraut and other fermented foods. Uh, first of all, it's a probiotic food, meaning it's rich in beneficial bacteria that will contribute to the diversity of your own microbiome, uh, which as I've talked about throughout this presentation is uh, a really great way to help your digestive system and your immune health and a lot of other aspects of your health as well. Um, the other, oops, sorry, uh, the other um, health benefit of this is it's full of fiber, it's vegetable fiber, which can help your elimination. Um, it's also, um, it preserves vitamin C in the cabbage, uh, which is great, so it's actually a good source of vitamin C. Um, Captain James Cook, uh, the famous explorer who uh, traveled to Hawaii and other places, he conquered scurvy using sauerkraut. He took barrels of sauerkraut on his ships and they uh, were able to avoid scurvy or vitamin C deficiency by eating uh, sauerkraut. And um, regular consumption of sauerkraut is associated uh, correlated with lower incidence of cancer um, and so it's, it's in general it's a very uh, healthful food. You can find other um, benefits in this wonderful book, The Art of Fermentation, by Sander Katz. He goes into a lot of uh, different ferments in this book and talks about the health benefits as well. So uh, I'll be right back when the cabbage is starting to sweat out a little bit more, and uh, we'll continue there. All right, it's been about 15 minutes, and the cabbage is getting real juicy. Check this out. Pick it up, and it's kind of dripping with its own liquid there, so we know it's ready now. All right, the next step is to pack it in your container. Uh, the different containers you can use, um, you can simply pack it into a jar like this, um, or you can use a larger glass jar. I'm lucky enough to have this really amazing crock uh, especially made for making sauerkraut. Uh, it's ceramic and it comes with a couple weights that keep... The key is to keep the cabbage underneath its own liquid when you're fermenting it. Otherwise it, it's exposed to air and that can interfere with the, the fermentation. So um, if you don't have a nice crock like this, you can still weight it down uh, using things like you know plastic bag full of brine on top of the cabbage, or if you're using a little bit of larger material, you can fill a jar up and weight the cabbage down. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pack this into my crock and um, try to get the water level to come up over it. All right, so we're just gonna put this in. Nice and juicy. Helps to use fresh cabbage as well. So it has more water content. And if for some reason your cabbage does not let out enough water to cover it, you can always make a brine 
um, adding some salt to, to uh, water and cover it so that it's completely submerging the cabbage. Okay, here's where we can get a little rough. Pound it down. I like to use my fist, but you can get special wooden pounders or use a baseball bat, whatever you have around the house. You know, it helps to get a little aggression out. Rough house the cabbage. Okay. And um, you may not have enough water until uh, a few hours have passed, depending on your cabbage. Um, but if you put some weight on it and wait, that will, uh, <laughs> um, that will usually solve the problem. You won't need to use any brine. So I'm going to put these weights on in there if you want to get a view of inside. That's how it's looking. You just stick this in. And press down. You can hear the squishiness of it. It's not quite covering it up, but it's pretty juicy cabbage. I'm pretty confident that in an hour or so, um, the fluid level will rise above the cabbage. Now, if you do pack the kraut into a jar and seal it, uh, beware of explosions. You know, fermentation creates carbon dioxide, and uh, there have been uh, there have been known to be some explosions happen if you seal it, a jar too tightly. So just make sure you either don't seal it or let it out after a day or two. Um, now, the nice thing about this crock is that it also has a water seal, so you can pour some water around the lid. That will let the carbon dioxide escape and not let oxygen in. And that will prevent something um, that is actually normal, and that's surface mold. So if you do ferment your cabbage in an open container, uh, there will be the surface of the liquid will be open to the air, and that will create conditions for what's called surface mold. It's completely harmless, it doesn't ruin your, your ferment, just skim it off. And if any of the cabbage has come up to the top um, and is in contact with that mold, just discard that, put it in your compost pile. It's not going to hurt anything with the, the sauerkraut. Okay, so how long do we let it wait? Uh, after a few days, taste some and see how you like it. Uh, that's kind of the only way to know if it's done because there's so many variables. How hot or cold your, your kitchen or wherever you're fermenting it is, how much salt you added, the type of cabbage you're using. Um, they all can affect how long it'll take before it's... Um, also your taste preferences. So the best thing to do is just taste it every few days. Uh, it could take a couple weeks, it could take a couple months, uh, or it could be to your liking in a few days. So just taste it, see how it evolves. Um, and just to review, the four steps of making sauerkraut. Chop, salt, pack, and wait. And all of those are very flexible. You know? And so I encourage you to experiment, try it out, uh, and see um, how good sauerkraut is. Alright, so that concludes my presentation. I thank you very much for watching, spending the time to check this out. Uh, again, thank you to Dino and Songmi for organizing this Piano Celebration Week. Um, if you're interested in learning more about my work, you can visit my website at evaningelstad.com. Uh, and I also set up a special resource section, uh, evaningelstad.com slash piano, with all the resources I've mentioned today in this presentation. So thanks again, and uh, goodbye.